Kota Rani, the fair and just Kashmiri queen. A short story by Geetka Kaul. Chapter 1. Kota's Test. Kota Rani was in one of the most prestigious schools of Kashmir. She was about to take a test that would determine her future completely. If she passed, she would one day receive a royal position in the court of Kashmir. If she failed, she wouldn't know how she would look her father in the eye. She was asked how she was feeling and was introduced to the pundits. And then the test began. The test went for a long time until one word was called. Fail. Kota was stunned. She knew at Shardapith that if you didn't graduate the first time, you were done forever. She felt the stare and the shame coming from her father. All the pundits were waiting for Devaswami, the head pundit's approval. Overruled, he yelled. Kota was extremely relieved. She was thankful that Devaswami was a fair and just person. Chapter 2 The Adventurers Kota woke up to the sound of a guard dog barking. He, she quickly got dressed and ran out the door. Kota, remember, where we are going is very dangerous. I want you to follow my lead, Ramachandra stated. They were going to the outpost due to a signal from the guards. There was danger. When they reached, they found three men with one injured. They all pleaded for help. Kota said that the injured one should receive help since he was the Prince of Lakta, and it would look bad if they didn't help. The other two men were left on their own. They had to fight a whole army off that was chasing them. That's why they wanted sanctuary in Kashmir. In front of Kota's eyes, she saw the two men single-handedly fight off the army and leave unharmed. Once more, they asked for refuge in Kashmir. When Ramachandra seemed unconvinced, they often their pr brilliant steed. Now, Ramachandra couldn't refuse. He gladly thanked the two warriors and let them inside Kashmir. When Rinchina, the prince of Lakta, felt a little better, they had a feast in his honor. During the feast, after all the fun stories and jokes had passed, the conversation became more serious. Runtina had pledged that he would protect and serve Kashmir forever. Ramachandra was touched and said that Runtina would have a bright future in Kashmir with plenty of splendor. With that, the feast was over. Ramachandra signaled to the captain, who presented Rinjina and his followers with gifts. The grateful Bhattas, his followers, bowed and left. Ramachandra and Kota walked back to their rooms. Kota asked Ramachandra if he liked, liked Rinjina. He said that there was much to be learned about him. Chapter 3 Dulcha Invades Kota was woken up from her sleep unexpectedly by a flaming arrow. Kota waited for another flaming arrow which signaled safety. Unfortunately, that arrow never came. Kota climbed to the top of the Gopadiri hill with her father, Ramachandra, the commander-in-chief of the armies of Kashmir. And already alerted Sudev, the king of Kashmir at the time, was already there with a group of followers. Apparently, there had been an attack at the hill. In a few hours, the first of the refugees started to arrive. The columns of people with barely the clothes on their back seemed unending. Stunned women, crying children, the old and infirm in a state of shock, the men bitter and angry, but afraid. Commander Ramachandra spies began reporting in. It was not unexpected. The signs had all been there that Dolcha might attack. Dolcha the king of a faraway destination, who would always overtake lands, had attacked with his army before the spring crops were planted. This meant that when autumn comes, Kashmir would run out of food. The guards, even the ones that had surrendered, had been brutally annihilated and hacked or butchered to death, one spy reported. 
There were also rumors circulating of the temples in Veramula being vandalized. Sudev organized a meeting with his cabinet and Kota. He was terrified of Dolcha and wanted to know what he could do. Ram, who is Dolcha? What do we know about the attackers? Sudev asked in a trembling voice. Dolcha is the leader of an army of 75,000 Turkic Mongol warriors, Ramachandra explained. He has 60,000 horsemen, 100 for each village in Kashmir, Ramachandra added. Sudev commanded Ramachandra to throw these barbarians out of the kingdom. Ramachandra said that that was a bad idea because the attack was nothing from a warrior's point of view. The purpose of the attack was to scare us, not to conquer. He wants to force us into battle, even when we don't have proper resources. An attendant had walked in and said that there was a messenger here from Dulta. The ambassador strode in, staring at everyone, and at Kota. He was extremely shaggy in his appearance. Dolcha's messenger's brief was very simple. He demanded unconditional surrender and ownership of everything. Dolcha also wanted the tip of the small finger of the Maharaj, which he wanted to add to the collection of the kings he had defeated. The Maharaj had one week to deliver his answer, or else. Chapter 4. He is defeated. The team of the army had reached Varamula where Dolcha had made his base camp. The party had reached the central tent when the ambassador to Dolcha had come out. Dolcha had followed. Staring down at the foreign minister with great intimidation, he said, What do you have for me? The minister eagerly tried to present himself in the best manner possible. Everything, my lord. Everything you wanted. I have brought you Sorvanesh, which is everything and more. I do not see everything. Where is the treasury? Where are the people that are now my slaves? Where is that Sudev amputated fingertip? said Dulcha. The ambassador grinned. My lord, our guests have insulted you. With great regret on his face, Dulcha pronounced the verdict. Foreign minister, your brief is over. You don't have the ears to correctly hear the message, nor the tongue, to apologize for your failure. My lord, I am merely a messenger, the minister croaked. Dolce's guards pounced on the foreign minister and poured boiling oil into his ears and mouth. He had died on the spot. When the Turkoman expedition approached the palace, the ambassador arranged his men in battle formation of units of ten. After a while of searching the palace, they realized no one was there. All they saw was a pilaf dish and chose to eat it as small consolation. What they didn't know was that the dish was infused with poisonous mushrooms. Within minutes, all of the army men were dead on the floor. The remaining army were taking over Kashmir. Over time, Kashmiris were killed and tortured while Dulcha still lived. One day, both sides decided to have a war. They both met on a battlefield and fought head to head. The Turkomen surrendered, but they said they would be back. While Dolcha was coming up with a new attack plan, a Kashmiri pundit that Dolcha had captured had been called. He was asked what the closest and fastest way out of Kashmir was. The Kashmiri pundit had said that it was a mountainous trail and only a man named Ishan knew where to go. Dolcha went to the entrance of the cave, the trail, as he was told, and waited for Ishan. He thought he saw Ishan and chased after him until he stopped looking at where he was going. Since Ishan was a mirage, he supposedly ran off a cliff, and Dolta followed, dropping to his death. Chapter 5. A Warrior Dead Lately, Rinchina had become corrupt. He started acting coldly to all the royal court members. He had also killed Sudev. Kota was an early morning prayer in the Tokur Koth, the meditation room, and Ravan, her brother, was still sleeping when they were taken prisoner by Tuka and Valia, Rinchina's right-hand men. Grabbing the two, and with the advantage of surprise and treachery, they swooped into Ramachandra's room, yelling war cries, and Rinchina, with a quick swipe of his sword, plunged it into Ramachandra's chest. Ramachandra had died. It has been told that Ramachandra's last words were, 
O oh, traitor, by your own hand, you stab your name forever. Kozarani fell into a deep depression and wouldn't talk to anyone but her best friend, Brahma. Chapter 6 Kota and Rinchino Kota was still locked up in her cell, and the only two people were Saras, allowed in were Saras, to attend to her needs, and Brahma to offer her company. One day, while in her small dirt cell, she had overheard Rinchino talking to Robin. He said that he wanted to marry and continue his reign, but he needed an heir. Kota heard this and was surprised. Who would the new Maharani of Kashmir be? A few days later, Rinchita came to Ravan and had an offer. I need somebody to help me rule Kashmir, and I think you would be a good fit. If you do not follow me, I suppose your future would be dim, Rinchina said. Ravan obviously didn't follow. Kota had gotten an idea. There was a prophecy that she knew of that the first person she married would die. So if she married Rinchina, he too would fall at some point. Meanwhile, Rinchina had accepted an invitation to go to Shamir, a very wealthy Musaman, um, who had come to the country a while ago. He had a new house. While there, Shamir had asked Rinchina what he was planning to do with Kotarani. Rinchina asked Shamir of his opinion on what to do with Kotarani. I will be happy to help out and take her as my wife. She will convert to Islam and move out of public life. At the appropriate time, I will ship her to Persia and sell her. She will be sold for a good price. There will be peace in the valley, and you can rule without absolutely any interference. In exchange, I will offer you my daughter, Guhara, in marriage, which will result in our families being bonded forever. Rinchina was caught off guard by Shamir's brilliant, yet twisted plan. When Rinchina returned from Shamir's house, he sent a message to Saras requesting her to tell Kota that he wanted to meet her. In this message, he referred to Kota as Kotarani, the Queen of Kashmir. It would be their first meeting after Kota was imprisoned by Rinchina. Saras replied, saying that Kota would meet Rinchina in the afternoon. Kotarani, he said, I know that you do not want to face me right now, but I hope you will listen. I want you to marry me. Kota turned slowly to face Rinchina and confronted him. She said that she would never trust him and that there was no point in trying to convince her. Then, suddenly, she remembered that if she married him, she could get him to die. Kota agreed to marry him under one condition. He would need to perform many penances to be forgiven for killing Ramachandra, Kotarani's father. Ram Rinchina agreed, and the two were set to be married. The ceremony was completed with great pomp. Chapter 7, Rinchina's End Toka, one of the lieutenants of Lakta, realized that Rinchina could be killed. And so Toka decided to kill Rinchina because he was told that he was worth nothing to Rinchina. Toka and his band put their heads together and devised a plan to kill Rinchina. Toka struck Rinchina on the head, who then fell uncon unconscious. Toka and his group entered the capital leaving Rinchina's body there. Valya, the other lieutenant, heard about Tuka's plan and came to rescue Rinchina. Rinchina stood up because he had faked his death. Tuka then was captured and taken prisoner. Soon after, Rinchina killed Tuka. While Rinchina was recovering from his injuries the next couple of months, he became closer to Shamir as he didn't think that the Lakhdis could be trusted. But in the monsoon season, his head wound became more infected, and as the weather became colder, his condition became much worse. As he prepared for death, in spite of Kotarani's wishes, he formally gave his son, Haider, to Shamir. At his deathbed, Rinchina asked Kota if she ever trusted him. She said no. Rinchina's last words were, What have I done? Chapter 8 Kota Remarries for many months, Kota's, Kotarani's committee sifted through possible candidates to marry Kotarani. And Yundev, Sudev's younger brother, um, his name kept coming up on top. He was handsome and had classic Kashmiri looks. He also had great intellectual compatibility 
to Kotarani. The two were married in a great celebration. This was the first marriage in which Kota was happy with her spouse. In a couple of years, the couple had a baby boy whose name was Jatha. Yundev then died in 1338 due to a stroke. Chapter 9 Shamir and Kota Rani. Shamir was a man who people didn't know much about. His intentions were almost always unclear. Now, people were starting to see the true colors of Shamir. He started an army, consisted of Muslims. It would cause destruction to places that didn't follow or appreciate Islam. Chapter 10, Kota's End. Yundev had um, fled to Tibet during the invasion of Achala. Kota defeated and killed Achala and drove away all the foreign troops before Yundev's death. Then, an uprising was started by Shamir. In the next few weeks, Shamir eventually started taking over small lands and towns in Kashmir, which eventually resulted in the capturing of major cities of Kashmir. He defeated the queen in Jayapur. Kota couldn't handle how Kashmir was slowly slipping through her fingers. The last queen of Kashmir committed suicide when she saw what peril Kashmir was facing. She stabbed herself to death. Her death in 1939 paved the way for the establishment of the Shamiri dynasty rule in Kashmir. Kota Rani was the last queen of Kashmir.